Today we're talking about Twitter infrastructure. Now I've had a couple drinks because we're going to go through some PTSD and some stuff I used to do for a bigger business. I mentioned in the last video in my subjective video about Twitter about how I used to work for a fairly large company. And now I don't do that. I do like small SMB stuff, just piddly stuff. And, and really the big thing I want to talk, tackle in this one is an objective view of Twitter's infrastructure. I want to lay it out as I understand it. Uh, I had to have a couple drinks over looking through their entire technology blog, which was kind of a hot mess. And I just want to make a video as I best understand their infrastructure and what the new team's going to be dealing with over there as I think they're going to have some turnover. Let's first address the elephant in the room. Can Twitter go down? Absolutely, it can. Uh, to il illustrate this, I want to put up their entire network infrastructure as I can uh, see from their documents. Do they use AWS or any kind of scaling solution through uh, some VPS provider? No, they do not. They don't use an AWS. Uh, they do use some Google Cloud that they've recently transitioned to, from my understanding, but very limited. And uh, most of it is in-house in, -house in uh, either probably a colo or something of that nature that they manage themselves. So this is going to get juicy. <laughs> it's going to get real good. Oh, man. I got to tell you, looking at these documents, I'm like, oh, this could be a disaster. And whoever's got to clean up after this, dude, it's like a third level of hell. Even if Elon offered me a million dollars, I wouldn't touch this with a 10 foot pole because, dude, that's going to be some late nights after we get into this right up here. Let's start with kind of how things are laid out in a lot of legacy systems. The worst thing you ever want when walking into a business is having to be crippled by legacy systems. And Twitter has quite a few of these. Uh, let's transition uh, over from BGP, which is kind of how everything's handled from a networking point of view. I'm just gonna overlay this at a high level because I'm not a network engineer. I, I have a good friend of mine that is, that has handled a lot of large projects for big companies. If you've ever watched any anime on the internet, chances are, you've actually used some of the networks designed by my buddy. But having said that, I just want to lay this out. Uh, BGP is something where if they mess up an update or something like that, it will go down. We've seen this in the past with Facebook and it didn't work out so well for them. They actually had more than a day's outage uh, across their entire platforms. <laughs> platforms, plural. That was Facebook. Meta, uh, WhatsApp, Instagram, all of them gone from a bad update. So BGP is pretty important and Twitter does control their own. Uh, I, I saw a popular, you know, hey, one of those Elon fans out there was like, hey, uh, it's just AWS. Anybody can come in and take care of Twitter. No, from everything I've read from their technical publications, it is a much more complex setup than that, as you see in the background here and someone doing a bad BGP update could spell some trouble. So that's the first area. And then we have just kind of how things are handled on the edge. You have your cache, you have those edge uh, point of presence that you got to take care of. But uh, most of this is going to get shoved over to your data centers and distributed out through these hosts. It's when you get into the storage that I kind of found the most interesting layout of all. It looks like they have a bunch of different legacy systems still in place that they're actually referencing depending on what's happening on Twitter. Now, if it's like a popular tweet or whatever, it's not even going to really hit this storage uh, because it has to hydrate that storage and, and that takes time. So like, let's say your favorite person on the, the, the Twitter's, Twitterverse tweets something. Well, that, and it gets retweeted like a hundred times or a thousand times or whatever it is. Once it becomes really popular content, that's going to stay in cache and, and Twitter does have a pretty robust cache system. So that's going to be easily distributed. But when some something has to be hydrated, like an old tweet, something that's not uh, being circulated very much, that's got to be hydrated by one of these storage systems in the background. In these storage systems, it looks like they have a bunch of legacy stuff. When Twitter launched, 
they used MySQL. It looks like just a, a plain old MySQL, fairly legacy. And then they expanded from that to Gizzard, which was like a sharded MySQL, so it could do some better scaling. And then they moved from Gizzard into Manhattan, which does even better. It's a multi-tenant solution, which is even uh, more powerful, and they can process many more pro transactions. So uh, I haven't personally dealt with this stuff. I just read the articles, and I was like, okay, I kind of get and gather around the gist of what they're doing. But the thing that I was kind of scratching my head on was they never sunset any of the legacy systems. From my understanding and from all the articles I read, all these are still referenced and still live and spun up. So ugh, having to deal with all those legacy systems after the original engineers have left, that's going to be an interesting task for whoever sad individual gets tasked with that. Not enough money in the world to pay someone to do that. I'm just going to tell you right now, that is a tall order. But I digress. Moving on, we also have some other stuff, like when you got photos and videos, those are not stored in MySQL, obviously. They're they're stored in, in something else like a blob store that they're using. And then they also were using some other SQL databases, it looks like, Postgres and some other ones that I was like, good Lord, I feel like they just kind of threw everything in the kitchen sink at this and just have anything and everything spun up with no standardization on the back end from what I read from the technical blog. Ah, dang. That's, that's a kind of a raw deal. So this is a pretty complex, pretty large, with a ton of different systems, with no standardization from what I could see. And that wasn't even the worst of it. <laughs> uh, well, well, before we get to the worst of it, let's first tackle of where this stuff is stored, because obviously it's not in just one data center. It's populated across the world. I would imagine this is where we have to speculate a little bit. I'll, I'll walk you through kind of what I see. Let's let's zoom out. This is a Dallas Fort Worth, kind of where I'm at. Uh, I'm going to take you to my old data center. Um, data centers are kind of really particular about taking photos in it. If you take a photo, typically a security personnel has to be present when you take that photo. And then they have to review that photo on whatever device you took it on to make sure it's okay. So you can't just take broad photos of the data center and then just say, here you go, internet. That's a, a bad, bad deal. So we're going to have to do it from my brain, but I'm going to show you the outside where these things are located and then take you in so you can kind of see and get a gist of the actual uh, storage that is happening here and how it would be laid out if, let's say, I were to set something up as a director or, or a vice president of IT. First off, this right here is Web Chapel in 635. There's a big data center here. It's named something else like OnCure or something like that. They bought it out. AT&T used to own this data center. We zoom down to the line level. This is the entryway. This is the actual visible photo we have. And then everything else going forward is going to be me laying out just kind of how these things work. So here is a blueprint kind of from my brain. It's not going to be exactly 100% scale from this interior of this data center, but this is kind of how it works. You walk into a lobby. You're presented at a security station. There's a, a shield. You give them your ID. And they go, okay, yes, you're Chris Titus. Go ahead, enter the man trap. You have two points of entry. Now, <laughs> this is where the movies get it wrong. You know, usually you think about fingerprints or retinal scans or butt scans, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's none of those things, actually. It's a hand scan. So when you're in these man traps, you enter in, you slide your hand in. And once it's in there, it scans the top. It, it analyzes your skeletal structure. The security personnel is looking at you both at the entry and once you enter the secure man trap room, you also have to, you know, uh, validate again. And then once you validate again on the second one, then you're allowed into the data center. So the man trap is just like it sounds. It's a trap for, for the man that's going to enter or, or, or woman. <laughs> and then you enter into the work area. Work area is typically where you spend most of your time in the data center because you can interface with most of your systems uh, once if they're up. Uh, now, over on the right, vending machines, bathrooms, showers. Uh, this is if you're going to be living in one of these places, which I had the unfortunate experience of living at one for two weeks. 
Yeah, that's just kind of what it looks like. And then comes to where the actual physical hardware is stored for these. Now, I've never actually had the privatized isolated cages, which is reserved for pretty much big companies, big spenders that usually have multiple 42U racks. I imagine this is where Twitter would house most of their stuff as these, these cages can get pretty big. And I imagine Twitter would pretty have a, have a large space. I, I would imagine at least 10, maybe 20 42 racks with a lot of their servers because I think they have house something like uh, 500 petabytes or something stupid uh, from a storage standpoint. And I know that's replicated. Typically these privatized racks have a fob key and then also a physical key to actually enter them. And then once you've entered in, then you're, you're good to go. So that's the big thing. Usually people are sitting in there doing things, but they never really leave the rack if they have to work on the physical hardware in there. And if they do, they'll come back to the work area. So I've chatted with these individuals on time to time. And uh, like I said, a good friend of mine still does this type of work. And then you have the rental space where you could get one of these 42 racks from like this data center. At the time, back in 2016 was the last time I entered into this specific one. We were paying about $900 a month for a 42 rack. This does not include internet, that's just the facility. So power is basically all they're providing you. And then you have to provide your own ISP, you have to provide your own uh, equipment, all that stuff is not provided and you are to do housekeep. So if they're doing it all in house, which I think they are, this is how it's done. Now, if you're renting just your own 42 rack, just a little tidbit here, that also requires a fob key and security personnel to open your rack. Uh, those are all privately secured. And when you swipe your fob key, only your 42 rack will open and unless it's bugged and then maybe you get another one and to access any of the servers in there usually you don't waste time with like kvms or any of that business you see in traditional uh racks that's typically done with something called a crash cart and an assistant uh so they'll usually just say oh yeah our crash carts are up here with this one little area you grab the crash cart push it back to your rack and then work away like the poor slave you are <laughs> And that is uh, how data centers or colos are pretty much done and probably how Twitter does it as of today from what I've gathered from their documents. Now, having said all this, we need to get into the problem that I see with uh, Twitter. And, you know, <laughs> this is where it gets really interesting and in, in why I'm more concerned now that I've looked into the back end of their infrastructure is they rely heavily on Puppet and Puppet is not fun to work with at all. Uh, most people use Ansible instead of Puppet, but Puppet is still very viable, still a very good solution, but they have literally a million lines of code of Puppet. That sounds like my own personal hell if I ever had to review that. I feel bad for any person having to review that. Looking at all this with Twitter, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know how you manage this much data. I don't know where you go from here. All I got to say with Elon is who cares about the headquarters? Who cares about the content system? Who cares about all this stuff that people are making a big hubbub about? If I look at this type of thing, I would try to retain as much as the senior engineers working at the data centers. Who cares about their office? their HQ with the personal chefs and all that stuff. The big thing that they need to worry about here is looking after these engineers. These engineers cannot be replaced by someone with industry knowledge very easily. This is a lot of legacy systems. This is a huge amount of stuff that has been propped up over the years with not very, very little uh, advancement. When I looked at their storage system, it looks like the last big upgrade they did was in 2014 when they moved uh, over from Gizzard to Manhattan for, for their SQL storage for a majority of like their tweets and stuff like that. Now, I think they're, they're trying to put something like Kafka in with GCP, and I think that's a more of a recent thing where they're trying to integrate with some of the, the VPS providers out there, your AWSs, I think they're, they chose Google Cloud Platform for some odd reason. I kind of like GCP, but... You know, Google Cloud Platform is not, not too bad. And, and I'm curious to see how that integration is going. And if they ever shut down any of these legacy systems, there's so many unanswered questions here. But again, I'd have to say, if I was Elon, I'd be sending all those personal chefs over to the data centers, the people in, in 
uh, that have all the industry knowledge, I wouldn't care about any of the actual corporate people in the headquarters. Uh, the engineering backend is not something you can just slap any individual in. There are people in Silicon Valley that could come in, geniuses that could come in and do this, but it's going to take multiple geniuses to untangle what's going on at Twitter in the back end of the infrastructure because this is not just, hey, grab some guy. Uh, and I, I definitely couldn't do it. And I'm just going to tell you, I might be able to piece together a couple people that could help me untangle some of it, but I still would not be 100% confident going in there trying to fix or retain this stuff where I would still need more personnel. This is a pretty big job. <laughs> In case anybody was wondering, uh, because I, I just had to make this video as I saw a comment saying, hey, it's just a bunch of uh, simple AWS scaling setup. This ain't that at all. And there's a lot of stuff going on at Twitter in the infrastructure realm that's really interesting. So uh, hopefully Elon's pretty nice to those network engineers. And he goes, okay, those are the really important guys. Those guys working in these data centers, they're really the true heroes, the, the ones there that are uh, in control of these things. Because if those all get let go, yeah, we could see some epic outages. But as far as the other people that are, all the other things and news folks are talking about, they don't matter. These are the real problems that Twitter faces. So we'll see what happens. Good luck to them. We'll see. Hopefully we see some improvements. It can't get any worse, right?